Good morning, everyone. This is a time when we remember Jesus coming to Jerusalem and coming home, essentially, to Jerusalem, where he was promised so many years before that he would come, that the Messiah would come on the exact day that Jesus showed up. And the whole city was looking forward to him, except for those who really should have known and didn't. If you'd uh, just pray with me. Father, this morning we thank you with joyful hearts that you sent your son, that you sent your son to be an example, to be a savior, and to deliver us from our own twisted selves. Thank you, Lord, that you knew we needed a savior, that your law was something that we could not keep, that your expectations of perfection would never be met in any one of us. So you sent your son to do it for us so that we might have life. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful. And then you give us your Holy Spirit to guard us and to keep us and to guide us. We are such a blessed people. Lord, give us a new understanding for what you've done today. Give us thankful hearts and help us, Lord, in all these things to be more like you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Jesus says as he is looking over Jerusalem, he says, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. They were for them, but they're not for us. Amen? And we understood exactly what that was for. So just a reminder where you are in case you're lost. So. Last week, if you remember, we talked about Zacchaeus. The wee little man, the wee little man was he? You remember that? Yeah. <laughs> he climbed up in the sycamore tree. I know, it's, it's one of those things, you press play and it's done. It, it, you got to go to the end. It's like the wheels on the bus. So, we talked about Zacchaeus and how he was looking for Jesus because he was short. He couldn't get up in the tree he, and he couldn't get uh, high enough over the crowd. So, he gets up in the tree to see Jesus coming. And strangely enough, Jesus was looking for him. And says, Zacchaeus, you got to come down because I'm going to your house today. And we're going to have dinner together, which is a tremendous privilege. And imagine the surprise. Like if I invited my house, myself and my 12 friends over your house uh, today uh, without notice. But he was glad to do that. And he repents of his lifestyle. He's a tax collector. He's a chief tax collector, which means he's extremely rich. And Luke makes sure he puts that down for us so we knew. And he repents of his lifestyle and he believes in Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. Praise God for that. And he says, look, redemption has come to this house today because you're a child of Abraham. And then Jesus, because the Pharisees were still criticizing him that he had gone and eaten with a sinner, with a known sinner, as though they weren't sinners or none of us are sinners. And he tells the parable of the 10 minas and how there was a wealthy landowner who went to far off land to inherit a country and he left his 10 servants and he calls them in one at a time and they each have made a profit with their money except for one guy who buried it in the ground. Put a handkerchief on it, probably, you know, put a headstone on it and, you know, declared it dead. And he did it because he was bitter at the guy who gave him the money. And he said, you're unfair if you expect me to make any money with this money you've given to me. <laughs> and extract payment. That's cruel. But God expects for us to bear fruit with the things that he gives to us. And so he talks about that and he says, you know, and those other guys who didn't want me to reign over them, bring them here and have them killed before me. Which shows judgment for those who uh, were in, in rebellion against God. And Jesus tells this parable about how it's going to be at the end. We're gonna each have to stand before God and give an account for the things that we've done. Praise God, all of you within the hearing of my voice have right now, right? And we can do things for the Lord right now. There's coming a day when we won't be able to. There's coming a day when we will all shut our eyes at some point in time and be with the Lord. And then it will be done. The package will be sealed. But today we have an opportunity. So we talked about that last week. Uh, I, I called it lost and found. Today it's Jesus coming home to Jerusalem. It begins here in chapter 19, verse 28 of Luke. And when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, 
And it came to pass that he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. This is a very suspicious cult jacking going to happen here. <laughs> and Jesus sends his disciples in. Why in the world wouldn't he just do it himself? Or why didn't he just go poof, make, you know, why not a horse? Why not a giant stallion? Jesus has to train his disciples even up to the very last week of his life. He's training his disciples to trust him and just do what I'm telling you to do. Any of you who have children know how wonderful that is if you have a child and they just do what you tell them to do. But they usually have that three-letter return. Why? <laughs> so the disciples are now going to go get a cult and he tells them exactly where to go and he tells them the town and he says, when you see it, it's going to be tied up, untie it and get out of there. And if anyone catches you, can you imagine? Just tell them the Lord needs it. If you were jumping into somebody else's car with keys and they say, hey, where are you going with my car? It'd be like, the Lord needs it. I'm not sure it would go over well. But this is what Jesus says. And he says, go get them. And he says, if anyone asks you, just tell them, the Lord needs it. So I imagine, you know, a couple of the disciples and in the background, there's this, you know, Mission Impossible theme. And they're going to jack a colt. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, long before Jesus ever came, a prophecy about the Messiah who would come says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. First of all, for a king to show up on the back of a donkey is a little silly. It's a little like the president riding a moped. It's a little ridiculous, right? But this is how Jesus chooses to come to Jerusalem, lowly and on the back of a donkey. It's this wonderful element that Jesus always has, which is meekness, which is not weakness. It's power under control. And Jesus doesn't need to, you know, come in riding, uh, you know, in a Maserati or he doesn't have to do that. He comes in lowly and meek as a savior. And so when those who were sent away went their way and they found it just as he had said to them, gee, what a surprise. <laughs> but as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? Which is a proper response. And they said, the Lord has need of him. They got the script right. Then they brought him to Jesus. There are a lot of people that debate whether this was a pre-planned thing that Jesus had planned or whether this was just Jesus uh, showing his omniscience and knowing all things. Uh, I would like to think he wasn't stealing somebody's stuff. But he says, you will find a cult in which no one has ever ridden before. Now, if you know anything about uh, mules, donkeys, that whole genus phylum family, they don't like people riding them if you've never ridden them before. It's like, you know, your child tries to ride your dog, which has never been ridden before, and <laughs> scoots out and the child falls and weeps. So this, th this is a miracle in itself. Jesus plans on sitting on an animal that hasn't been broken, but he does, and that's his plan. Interesting thing about the donkey, doesn't that look familiar? Even as Jesus was to ride a donkey into Jerusalem, there's the sign of the cross right on the back of the donkey, a reminder of why he's there and where he's going. 
And I just find that an absolutely amazing thing that the cross was always set before him. He knew it. He gave his disciples a heads up before they went in. He says, listen, I'm going to go into Jerusalem. They're going to spit at me. They're going to tear my clothing. They're going to crucify me. But don't worry, on the third day, I'll come back. And they were like, what? They didn't get it. And here's Jesus with all these little subtle reminders that this is what he's here for. This is his mission, is to give his life as a ransom for us. There was one other time Jesus was on a donkey. When Mary was pregnant with him. And it's actually the only two times that you hear about Jesus on an animal. It's rather interesting. It's a little trivia for you. It's a, it's a freebie. That was a freebie. And 1 Kings 1, 33 to 35 gives us a little bit of a backstory in the Jewish mind so that they might understand what it is when they see Jesus, a full-grown man, on a little bitty donkey with his sandals dragging in the sand, probably. The king also said to them, this would be King David, take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. And there let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the horn and say, long live King Solomon. And then you shall come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne and he shall be king in my place. For I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. This was how Solomon was installed as being king. He rode in on David's donkey on his mule and they installed him on the throne. You know that everybody in Israel, everybody in Jerusalem was looking forward to Jesus doing that. Because at this point, the Romans had subjugated them. So they were basically slaves under Rome. They're looking for a savior in a political way. He came to be one in a spiritual way to deliver us from our sins. But they didn't understand that. And so this is very much like what Solomon did when he was installed. And so I believe that's why Jesus did this. In verse 35, and they went through, they, they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. And as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice and all the mighty works that they had seen saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The other versions tell us they said, Hosanna, which is a direct quote from Psalm 118. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Jesus said, this is such a momentous thing and you guys are completely missing it. They said, these people are proclaiming you to be the Messiah and they're worshiping you like you were God. You got to tell them to shut up. They're wrong. And Jesus said, they're not wrong. And he said, if they, if they shut it down, then the stones would cry out because the earth would recognize its creator, but these people did not. And so Jesus comes in and we call this Palm Sunday because it wasn't just uh, clothing that they put down on the ground, but it was also these palms. And it's kind of like rolling out the red carpet, but it was a little bit more than that. Jesus, first of all, is riding on a donkey that had never been ridden before. What's the significance of that? Well, it's amazing Jesus could stay on him. And secondly, if you think about it, all of the sacrifices that are brought into Jerusalem, none of them were ever to have been ridden or used for plowing or used for any such reason. They were to be completely untouched in that regard to be a sacrifice. The red heifer, which is sacrificed to open up all of the worship in the temple, was not to ever have a yoke upon it. It was to be unridden and unworked. And Jesus comes in as the Lamb of God as a perfect sacrifice on the back of an animal that has never been ridden, signifying he's the sacrifice. 
they would bring in the time of Passover, they would bring in the lambs and they would have to be in perfect condition. Not one blemish, not a cut, not anything. And so it was very difficult to get an animal from a faraway land in. And so they had developed this whole system where you'd be able to buy one there, but you couldn't use your money because your money usually had the picture of somebody and that was a, a graven image. And so they had money changers that would change money to make sure that you could use the shekel, which is what they used in the temple. And you wouldn't have this atrocity, a picture of some dude that claims he's God like Caesar. You wouldn't use any of that money in the temple precincts. So there were people exchanging money and making a lot of money at it. And there were those who were giving animals who were a better shape than the one that maybe you brought because they found a little nick or a little wart or something on it. And they would charge you an exorbitant amount of money. This was what Jesus walked into. He walked into this sort of a circus atmosphere. And the, the Pharisees, because they were in business to make money, didn't recognize him for who he was because they had their head in their own business and they didn't have their mind on God's business. So Jesus comes in and they would typically do this along the road so that your sacrifice that you're bringing on a, on a leash wouldn't get dirty, wouldn't get scuffed up and marred up, wouldn't trip on a rock. Or, and so here comes Jesus, the sacrifice lamb, the perfect lamb of God in which they'd have a week to check him out before they crucified him, coming in with the ground covered because he's the sacrificial lamb. It says in Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. That's what they were chanting was Hosanna. Uh, you're looking at it in English here, but that's in the Hebrew. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. That's what Hosanna means. Save now. I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and he has given us light. And then there's this really interesting twist. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Because a week later, the same Jesus that they're acclaiming and praising and worshiping, they will say, crucify him, crucify him. Tie him up, put him on the horns of the altar. That altar would be the cross. This was all mapped out by God long before it ever happened. And I'm just highlighting a couple of Old Testament passages. There are about 300 that Jesus fulfilled in his coming, which statistically speaking, no one else could do. Verse 41, now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this day, the things which make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, speaking of the city, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus wept. Imagine the crowd is excited. They're, they're all saying, Hosanna, save now. And Jesus is weeping. All of the people are rejoicing and Jesus is weeping and they're completely unaffected. This struck me this year. Jesus wept as the people praised and none entered into it with him. And he wept. This is one of three times that we're told Jesus weeps. One is at the raising of Lazarus. Two is here as he comes upon Jerusalem and he weeps because they don't get it. They don't understand. It, they're not seeing him for who he truly is. And it's not that his self image is shot. It's that their salvation is right there and they don't see it and they don't accept it. Jesus still weeps over the lost. He still weeps over the blindness of people who don't understand him to be who he is. And I think we should enter into that with him. 
as great as the praise is, as we praise God here today, there's a, there's a, something in my heart that says, wow, I, I wish all of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters could be here. I, I wish that a lot of my loved ones could be here. I wish that people who don't know him could be here. And there's a, there's a sense of uh, like communion, which is always, I remember the price of my sin was the life of God himself as he came in the person of his son. And yet, what would I do without it? So Jesus is weeping over the city and I can only imagine the, the, the heartbreaking view that that is. Oh, and the third time Jesus wept was when he was in the garden. And he said, Father, if this cup could pass from me, in other words, if you could give this job to somebody else, but not my will, but thy will be done. And that, that's kind of the underpinning of what it is to be a Christian, isn't it? It's like, Lord, I, I really don't want to do this, but you know, I don't want to get up and go to church today but not my will, but thy will be done. And there's always joy in serving the Lord. Amen? Amen. And he says, there'll be a time in which there will not be one stone upon another. In, in 67 AD, the Romans surround Jerusalem and they go to ransack Jerusalem. And in 70 AD, it eventually falls. It's, it, it catches fire kind of accidentally. Um, and the golden dome that was on top of the temple melts and all of the Roman soldiers in an effort to get the gold, take every single gigantic stone that's there and unearth it so they can dig out all the gold that's between the stones. So Jesus tells what's going to happen in about 35 years from this moment, exactly what's going to happen and it happened exactly as Jesus said. In Daniel chapter 9, we're given this prophecy of when the Messiah would come to Jerusalem. Daniel, a big fan of prophecy, he writes this from the Lord. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, until Messiah the prince, or Negev, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall. And this is the time when Jerusalem was torn down even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Long before Jesus came, Daniel gives the prophecy that the Messiah will come and the exact day in which he would arrive. And it's amazing because many in Jerusalem recognize that day. The Pharisees, who were supposed to be the religious elite, didn't get it. And Jesus holds them accountable to know. The 10th of Nisan, April 6, 32 AD, Jesus rides in, which is exactly 1,700, sorry, 173,880 days from the edict to rebuild the city of Jerusalem by Artaxerxes of Persia on March 14th, 445 BC. There's a book called The Coming King in which an English dude wrote this thing. He actually has a sir before his name. And he actually won a Nobel Prize for writing this book who shows all of the days based on a 360 degree, 360 day year that Jesus would come exactly the day that he showed up on what we call Palm Sunday. And Jesus said, you should have known I was coming especially the religious elite. They should have gotten it, but they didn't get it. In Zechariah chapter 13, it says this, In the day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David. By the way, the fountain that was opened for the forgiveness of sins was the very body of Jesus Christ. In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for the sin and for uncleanness. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. This is God speaking. Against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. This was a prophecy given years before Jesus ever showed up. And that this would happen. A fountain would be opened up. 
how do you know that it's the fountain of his body or of his blood? Because Hebrews 9.22 explains, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. God has set up this principle from a long time ago that the only way that our sins are taken care of is the blood of an innocent being shed. And that's why Jesus came. Human sacrifice is nothing that God ever required, but a sacrifice of an innocent animal that was set aside, that was made special, almost a pet of the family, and you would have to put your hands on it and have it sacrificed underneath you. The PETA people would have a crazy time. And that is how, by your faith and being obedient to what God has said, that is how your sins will get covered. But Jesus comes and forgives sin, which means it's washed away. It's like it never was. And that is the essence of Christianity. Anybody that tells you anything else is trying to sell you something. And then, verse 45, then he went to the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. And, it, and were unable to do anything. For all the people were very attentive to hear him. What they don't tell you between the previous verses and 45 is that there was a day that passes. And Jesus goes back to Bethany and spends the night. And the other gospels will verify that. He comes the next day and he's prepared to do business. And he marches into the temple and he casts everybody out that's doing business because they turned it into a bazaar. And there were money changers that were making exorbitant amounts of money. And there were people selling animals, making exorbitant amount of money. And they turned it into a marketplace. And Jesus said, this is my father's house. You have turned it into a den of thieves. And he made a cord, which takes some time. He makes a whip out of a cord. And he begins to whip the animals because nobody was moving fast enough. And you go, Jesus did that? Jesus did that. Why? Because he hated the sin. He hated what religion had become. It became this form without heart. It became this outward presence, and yet there was no essence in it. And that got him so mad that he walked in. I wonder if I walked into a mega church and did that today, if, <laughs> if I'd get away with it. It's kind of the doom that evil people will take something as pure as worship to God and try to profit on it and try to extract money from people and turn it into a business. And pastors go from being pastors to being life coaches. Yeah. My job's here to teach the word of God because this is what will endure forever. Amen. I'm not much of a life coach. So Jesus goes into the temple because of his hate for this sin and what it has become. And yes, Jesus was angry. Is there ever a time to be angry? Absolutely. Yeah. Not if somebody bumps in you on the way out of here. I just want to let you know, you got to forgive that and let it go. And about a million other things. But you see, he was on a mission from God to do that which was right. And he had zeal in his heart for that which was right. And you know, Christians need to get mad about things. Mm -hmm. Not about things that are personal to you but things that God tells you you should be mad at. I should have the heart of God, and I know God's mad at stuff. Well, people, I don't know if, if you had an issue like this, but I was addicted to anger. I loved anger. Anger was my friend. I clothed myself in anger. I was angry at people for no reason, mostly because I was not right with God. And so I bathed in it. I spoke it. I, I, knew, I knew how to offend everyone with a look. I think I'm out of touch now. I won't try. So Jesus clears out this temple and it was the only place that the court of the Gentile, a thousand feet by a thousand feet, this huge area, which would fit over 60,000 people, by the way. And they turned it into this craziness and Jesus cleaned them all out. It was the only place that a Gentile, a non-Jew would be able to go. It's the closest you would ever get to the presence of God. And they turned it into a circus. And Jesus was offended because it wasn't welcoming. It was not what God wanted. 
I, I think about that whenever people say, yeah, you should, we should have bingo in this church. <sighs> That's not what a church is for. And of course, I have to bring up this passage in Ephesians chapter 4. We're told by the Apostle Paul, be angry. Now, if you put a period there, then, hey, good morning, good morning, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> Comma, and do not sin. That's like walking a tightrope. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't go to bed angry. Nor give place to the devil or give him a foothold. It's uh, like he's climbing into, into your heart and you don't want to give him an opportunity to get in there and be part of your life. And so anger is one of those things that we have to be careful for. We usually get angry because somebody hurts our feelings or uh, somebody offends us in some way, shape or form, but that we shouldn't get mad at because I'm sure you've offended people. What about when you get cut off? Don't you hate that? <laughs> bad drivers. I hate, I hate bad drivers. I hate them. Sometimes I am a bad driver. So I should have grace. I should have grace. Because sometimes, you know, when the two lanes go to one lane and I think I got a spot, but I don't got a spot. And people don't see me because their truck is way up here and my car's way down here. These things happen. But should I not be angry about the things God is angry about? And shouldn't I weep for the things that Jesus weeps for? Shouldn't that be where my heart is? Absolutely. And so as we go through this week and we think about everything from Jesus' entry into Jerusalem to him cleansing the temple and him being in the temple and teaching every single day and the critics looking at him and examining him and asking him questions. And the book of John is the, the most extensive gospel that talks about the last week of Jesus and all of the things that he did are very much expanded there from a first person witness. Luke is just giving us a basic overview. He was not a first person witness. He was a recorder and he was just taking down the facts, just the facts, ma'am. As we go through this, this week, all the way to the resurrection, as we think about what God has done for us, I hope that this year holds a special time in your life where you will reconnect with God in a way that is deep and meaningful and impactful in your life. I really do. And in thinking about Jesus coming home, Jesus lives here. And there needs to be an entry of Jesus into our hearts, not just into our minds, not just in, into like an ingredient in a soup. And it's just part of, it needs to be, he needs to be the foundation of our very lives. And I would hope as Jesus comes to you and speaks to your heart, even in today, even as I, I was telling a story and just reading through this, I pray that God has touched your heart in some way that's going to make a difference in the way that you live for him that you would recognize the Messiah, that you would recognize Jesus as he comes. As I, uh, as I let the worship team be found, we're going to be praying. So pray with me. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your heart of love that sent your only son to come and die for us so that we might have a savior. That you would help us not to be imprisoned by our own desires, our own addictions, our own imagination, our own weaknesses. And Lord Jesus, I want you to come home in each one of our hearts, including mine. Because Lord, there's always room to throw out the garbage and to give you more room in our lives. I pray that this time, Lord, that this day for many would be a new beginning. Each one of us as we see you, Lord, coming, that we would accept you as they did with palm branches and throwing their clothes on the ground and singing Hosanna, save now. Lord, I pray that you would continue to save us now. Guide us and help us, Lord, we need it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.